Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, September 9th, 2020, and today we're going to be talking about an electoral college nightmare. Essentially, in this video, you're going to see what happens exactly when a presidential tie, meaning there's 269 on both sides in terms of the electoral vote count, and there are no faithless electors, and pretty much this would just give the presidency to the House of Representatives and the vice presidency to the Senate. We'll talk about what map would actually give us a 269 tie because realistically it isn't too likely to happen but based off the current trends that we're seeing joe biden could end up in a rut where he ends up with barely enough electoral votes to get to 270 and we'll talk about that as we go through the map so let's go ahead and characterize all of the safe states there is no reason to talk about them too heavily they're going to go one way or another regardless so characterizing all of them now pretty much joe biden carries 182 electoral votes straight off the bat Donald Trump typically gets 125. Um, that's without the state of Texas. So let's go ahead and characterize all of those electoral votes at this point and then include Alaska. And then we're at 125. Okay. So now that we're at the, uh, the safe states for Donald Trump, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these swing states. So Joe Biden has actually done very well in the Clinton states from 2016. Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Virginia, New Hampshire. These are five states that were mildly close with the exception of New Mexico, the rest of them were under 5%. Actually, I think Virginia was slightly over, but uh, generally around that ballpark, uh, New Hampshire was the closest out of all of them, decided by a mere 2,000 votes. But as we've seen you know, in this state uh, of New Hampshire, Joe Biden has done phenomenally better than Hillary Clinton, getting 51.4% of the expected vote share according to preliminary election data. In Nevada, Biden is up by 7%. He was up, as you can see, by 8% in New Hampshire. As we go over to Colorado, he's up by an even larger margin, by 12%. Going down to New Mexico, he is up in this state by 13%. And then if you take a look at um, Virginia, oops, that's all the way down here, you can see that Biden is up by 11%. So those states, I'm pretty comfortable with their characterizations. I think that Trump will still carry Texas at this point. I still think he's the favorite to carry Georgia and Ohio and Iowa. But that puts him at 203 and Biden at 219. Where do we get a scenario where all of a sudden Biden is able to get 269 and not cross that finish line? Well, essentially, this would require both Nebraska's 2nd and Maine's 2nd District to go to Trump, as they did in 2016. Now, for Maine's 2nd District, this one is actually neck and neck. Biden and Trump are within one to two percentage points. In Nebraska's second district, Trump uh, actually loses to Biden by three, four percent. But uh, generally, you know, based off the 2016 election results, he's still the favorite to uh, do well in that area. And I could very easily see him winning Nebraska's second district. I don't think he's the favorite, but it's definitely possible. It's by no means out of reach. But for, you know, Trump to carry Maine second district, I think that's a lot more feasible than Nebraska's second. And, you know, looking at the electoral map, Joe Biden is likely to carry a state such as Minnesota. This is a state that went to the Democrats in 2016. And while it may be closer, very, you know, very well could be closer than Michigan. I'll tell you that much. Um, spoiler alert, Michigan does not go to Trump in this map. It's only a 6.2% lead. This is down from what, an 11 point lead back in July, but a six point lead for someone who, uh, you know, is comparing themselves to a Hillary Clinton victory here by 1.5%. I honestly think, you know, anyone would take 6% over 1.5% in terms of an electoral margin. Um, maybe not interest rate, but you know, uh, looking at the numbers, I mean, Biden's exactly where Hillary Clinton was four years ago. This is the number she got, you know, taking away faithless electors. She got 227 actually, but uh, for Trump, you know, he very well could win some other states. He could do well in North Carolina. Right now, that state is practically neck and neck. Uh, Biden is only up by 2%, I believe, 1.8%, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And also in Florida, this one actually has, you know, narrowed up a lot. We're going to talk about Florida tonight in one of my videos, um, talking about this entire demographic group that is typically solid for the Democrats, that is solid in pretty much all of the other states, except for Florida. And what we've seen is Florida has considerably narrowed up. I mean, in July, Biden was up 7.6%, 8% in Florida, 8% in Florida, 29 electoral votes, decided the 2000 election, went with the you know presidential election winner in 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016. And now it's so close that it's going back and forth between who's leading. I think the last time it was wrong was 1992 when it went for George H.W. Bush, and he's a Bush. So it's been right for decades. And for Florida, you know, for Florida to be so close now, I mean, it, it has rapidly narrowed up. We're talking about a three point lead, which, you know, used to be 8%. And this 2.5% lead is nothing that Biden can just say, you know what, I'm comfortable with where I am in Florida. It's still good because Trump was up in this state on election day in 2016. But you also have to realize that, 
you know, there very well could be these undecided voters in Florida, which proved to us in 2018 that they are immune to wave years. What does that mean? Even in a general wave year, the Democrats did not reclaim the majority of seats from the House of Representatives in Florida. They lost the Senate seat despite having a Democrat incumbent. They lost the governorship despite being the favorite to win, you know, all three of those. Win more House seats than the Republicans. Carry the Senate race. Retain it. Uh, you know, win back the governor's mansion. They didn't do any of the three. And the unfortunate reality for the Democratic Party is that Florida, you know, these Cuban Hispanic voters are not the same as the rest of the Hispanic voting population in this country. They completely, you know, you know diverge. We're talking about a Republican group versus a Democratic group. That's how significant of the difference is. And we're seeing it, you know, clear as day in this state. Where Biden is improving amongst white voters, he's losing amongst Latino voters. In this state, in the state of Florida, the most recent poll that just got released, Trump actually leads in terms of Hispanic voters. In 2016, that was not exactly the case. In Miami-Dade County, a huge voting block for the Democratic Party, we could likely see this state you know, move away because of lack of of votes. But moving past this state, this is a topic for tonight's video. Florida could easily go to Donald Trump. I mean, we're talking about Florida, which I normally characterize as lean. I never pushed it past lean because even though the data may have suggested an eight point lead, we all knew how Florida is. Florida is just Florida, to put it plainly. Um, and it's 29 electoral votes could go to Donald Trump. He's not the favorite to win it. I still think that Biden would come out on top if this election was held today. But that's assuming that, you know, Trump isn't able to make up a 2.5 percent deficit, which 2016 proved to us he very well could. But it's hard for me to see him, you know, making up a seven point deficit two months out or 55 days out, actually. So a little bit under two months. But Florida goes red. You know, Arizona would actually have to go blue. And I honestly think that Arizona very well will go blue after the comments that have supposedly been said by Donald Trump about John McCain. Actually, he did say them. That's factual. He said it uh, in 2015, he even tweeted it out. But in terms of military members, I honestly think that this is going to be a lasting blow. That's a recurring theme from the Democratic Party that Trump doesn't care about America and he only cares about himself. And while that may not resonate with a lot of the Trump base, I don't see that 42, 43 percent voting block moving away from President Trump. But for the rest of these undecided voters, and maybe these never Trump Republicans, they may jump on board with John Kasich. They may jump on board with Ann Romney. They may jump on board with Cindy McCain because these are people that, you know, I guess you could say don't always vote party lines. They loved McCain. They loved Romney, but they were iffy about Trump, but just hated Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden's approval rating is way higher than where Hillary was four years ago. So this election is not about the Democratic Party nominating the lesser of two evils. In this scenario, people actually like Biden. Believe it or not, politics outside of Twitter and YouTube, people really do like Joe Biden, Democrats and Republicans alike. I mean, I know a number of Republicans that are very well voting for Trump, but they do think that Joe Biden is a, you know, a kind man. They can they definitely did not say the same for Hillary Clinton. I mean, obviously, she's not a man, but uh, they did not like her whatsoever. And, you know, the honesty card was pulled. Oh, we can't trust her with national national security. A number of these things that they all trust Joe Biden with. And he has this very genuine feel that comes with this campaign, which is probably why he did so well in the Democratic primary, despite being underwater practically after the first three contests and then completely took it back in less than a week. Anyways, moving past that, um, you know, surprisingly, Surprisingly, Joe Biden's birth state of Pennsylvania is the state that he is actually leading by the smallest amount. Let's take a look. In Pennsylvania, Biden is not up uh, by too shabby of a margin. It's 5% over Donald Trump, 5.1% actually. But in Wisconsin, he's up 8%. In Michigan, he's currently up uh, 7%. So I think that, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin, there's a possibility where Michigan, Wisconsin go to Biden. But get this. Look at his number. 269. And if Trump is able to carry Pennsylvania, which has shown us in the past couple of days that it's narrowly tightening up, you know, marginally, and it very well could move back to the Joe Biden column. But if this trend continues, it could be only a three point lead on Election Day, which arguably, I mean, that was the same lead that Hillary Clinton led in Michigan. While it was in, within the margin of error, um, you do have to realize that. Biden's campaign should not be comfortable by leading only by 3% in Pennsylvania or by 2.5% in Florida or by 1.8% in North Carolina. Those numbers are not solid enough to say we're confident we're going to win these states. But the Wisconsin and Michigan margins, they should be very confident in. They shouldn't stop putting resources. They should not pull you know, a Clinton campaign and not visit the state. The last Democratic nominee to visit that state was in 2012 with Barack Obama. So um, when you look at these states, you know, the Biden campaign is making an insane effort in order to win them. And I honestly think that they're going to go right where the Clinton campaign went wrong and they're going to focus on the Rust Belt. But based off the numbers right now, Pennsylvania seems to be the one that they have the smallest grip on. And Pennsylvania actually, you know, defied all expectations in 2016, while Wisconsin and Michigan were 
pretty much neglected by the Clinton campaign. They held the DNC in Pennsylvania. I mean, she visited that state so many times, spent $30 million compared to $1.6 million in Wisconsin. So you can see that was why Pennsylvania was such a big, you know, thorn in the side for the Democratic Party because it was a part of the blue wall. Hillary Clinton was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, as was Joe Biden. And a number of things that very well could have played well with her tying herself to the Obama administration in Pennsylvania. I mean, he won this state by very solid margins in both of his elections. Uh, they just didn't play well. And that's why it's hard for us to say that Pennsylvania will be super solid for Joe Biden. I definitely think he's the favorite. I think he's going to win Pennsylvania without a doubt, especially if the election was held today. But you do have to acknowledge that this is a state that the Democratic Party has the weakest grip on. So here we are, 269, 269, not too far-fetched, huh? You know, looking at Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, they're all favorites for Joe Biden. He's not the favorite in any of these uh, southern states, except for maybe Florida and, you know, maybe North Carolina on a good day, but not right now. So Florida is actually the only state out of this entire region, including actually just cutting around Illinois, where Biden is the favorite to win it. And take that out of the scenario, Trump wins it. Trump wins one Rust Belt state. We're at 269, 269. So let's move on. What happens now? Well, this is the Senate map. This is where my Senate characterizations go. What's so interesting about the Senate? They decide the vice president. And if you see a 50-50 tie, chances are that Mike Pence will be electing himself as vice president. You know, when you're taking a look at these, uh, you know, looking at these numbers, the Democratic Party is ramping up their efforts in the Senate, not only because, um, you know, they need something to work with the Biden administration, but there is a possibility that a tie does happen. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at the Senate races, they need an absolute majority. They need more than just, you know, a po possibility of a vice president Kamala Harris breaking the tie. And being at a 50-50 scenario puts the Democratic Party at a very weird situation because if there is one Democrat, a conservative Democrat, Joe Manchin, John Tester, the list goes on, that says, you know what, my constituents are not going to agree with this. My constituents do not want me to pass this bill. They don't want me to vote on this. Yes, I may be retiring, but I'm not going to turn my back on my West Virginia voters or my Montana voters. And these Democrats are going to say, you know what, I'm breaking party lines. And where does that put the Republicans? Practically in the majority. If the Democrats want any hope of passing something that's actually substantial, D.C. statehood, Puerto Rico statehood, Medicare for all, they're going to need way more than 50 seats. It's not going to happen this year. I mean, maybe D.C. statehood could possibly happen, but, you know, that's a whole other beast to tackle. And looking at the Senate map, the Democratic Party would be in another world of trouble because we would be in a very close scenario where it is possible that uh, Mike Pence does break the tie and elects himself as vice president. Um and let's move on to the presidential race. But like I said, that tie in the Electoral College would likely lead to what is supposed to be a tie in the Senate at this point, which would just make the entire thing, you know, much longer and make it a very grueling and very arguably undemocratic process. And looking at the House of Representatives map, this is based off party composition. Take all the electoral votes out of consideration. Each state gets one vote. That's right. California gets the same amount of votes as Wyoming. And if we're looking at the House of Representatives delegation, how do they do this? They all vote. So if I actually have, uh, you know, given you a map where there are more Democrats versus more Republicans in the House of Representatives from those states, collectively they vote and each state counts as one. So if you're looking at Minnesota, more Democrats there, but it counts as one. Take out those 10 electoral votes. So the first person to 26 wins. And right now, the Republicans currently have the majority in 26 states. Despite the Democrats being up in the House of Representatives by 35, 36 seats, they still don't have the party lead. I mean, they aren't leading in terms of representation in a number of these states. They're tied in Michigan and Pennsylvania, which even if they do go to Biden, assuming he wins the popular vote, which it is possible that maybe one Republican defects in Pennsylvania or Michigan, it goes to the Democrats. But then you still see the Republicans are at 26 Trump still wins. You would need to see uh, you know, a map where uh, the Democrats could possibly flip a state with the incoming House of Representatives because that's who decides the presidency, the incoming House. So when we see Wisconsin and we see Ohio and North Carolina and Georgia and Florida and Texas, while they may be targeted heavily by the Democratic Party, they are by no means the uh, you know, current favorites to win more seats. They may marginally improve off their House margin, but it's not enough to change this. So from what goes and is would be a tied scenario 269 to 269 would end up with the vice presidency you know in a tie at 50 50 in the senate and then you go to the house of representatives and it's decided by the incoming house where you know biden may have well won the popular vote and may have won over a number of states he would still lose wisconsin despite winning it on the electoral college he may have uh, you know won another state 
And, you know, Trump may have won Iowa in the Electoral College, but the Democratic Party has more representatives from there. So that one vote in those states will just make this entire process seem super undemocratic. And arguably, it very much is. And that's a very unfortunate reality about what happens when we hit 269 to 269, which is exactly why I personally would dread this map uh, more than any other map. Just because this would just prolong an already long election process of a vote by mail system where we might not know the election results till a week later to getting into a system where the House of Representatives is now deciding it and we're talking about political party favors and the Senate is a tie. It'll be a whole mess and a half. But that's pretty much how the American democracy works in its perfect form. So quick announcement. Um, I just announced this on my community tab. I am selling, I guess you could say merch. Um, I did try to make them reasonably priced. So I'm sorry if they seem pretty expensive, but uh, Teespring did suggest to me some prices that I just seemed to be very outrageous. So I tried to cut it down pretty significantly. For example, the hoodie, they recommended me to sell it for $42. And I was like, that is too much money for a hoodie. Um, but yeah, so I'm selling different things. So for example, this t-shirt, if we take a look at it, it actually has a couple of things, which, um, different colors, which I honestly think is pretty cool. The link will be in the description below and also on my community tab on my channel. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord link for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2020 election videos. If you do have any suggestions for what you might want to see for merchandise or you know any type of slogans that you want me to put on there, go ahead and comment that down in the uh, comment section. I'll be reading all of the comments. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.